So this is a comment by the True Puka in regards to feminism. It comes on a video, one of the worst videos I've ever seen, I've ever seen uh, regarding this topic. You can go watch that if you like. Reflected in the simplicity of the matter. However, Puka goes on to say this. Right? He understands feminism as the goal of seeking that both sexes have equal representation and rights under the law. In other words, neither sex gets preferential treatment, nor do they get penalized. Well, that's a very noble pursuit, I would think. However, if you look at what comes out the other end, you see something quite different. You see, if this notion is true, then all you have to do is go and look and see for yourself what is happening and see if it matches the general sentiment here if it doesn't then you might want to question the original premise you see now when I came into feminism a couple of years ago I never heard of anything such as a MRA uh, all of my interactions were with feminists people who identified as feminists Everything I looked into online, the books I read, the papers I read, were very much in regards to feminist work. It took me probably at least a year to run into anybody identifying as an MRA. So much of my criticisms were built off of the first experiences I've had in what I've read online, offline, here and there, experiences with different people. Now, they don't always identify as feminists, we must understand. But, one of the first things I started to notice was how feminists talked about certain things. Mainly, the two big ones that stick out in my mind right now, and what I'll be talking about, are domestic violence and child abuse. Now, when I read or talked to or listened to videos or whatever it was most of my experience I found and this is just uh, obviously anecdotal it's just my experience right my experience led me to believe that ultimately many of the feminists if you want to make a distinction that's fine many of them don't understand and many uh, many people don't even identify a feminist that talk about it in this regard the general zeitgeist, the general, if you look at a Mendham's video there, you see. I, I doubt he really, you never hear him talk about feminism, right? It's not like a feminist activist or anything like that. But if you listen to that video, all of the typical stereotypes regarding men and things of this nature come out. And we'll talk about that more in a minute, too. But what I began seeing, I, what ultimately what I found is that I got the very much impression that these radical feminists, Marxist feminists, some of them don't identify as that, some of them don't identify as feminists at all, don't really care about rape. They don't really care about domestic violence. They don't really care about child abuse. They only want to use these things for their own ideological ends. I came to that conclusion on my own, not from any, some MRA, or it just through my own readings and experiences with feminists. As I began to investigate more, I began to see more and more of this as time went on. You see, because if someone really cared about these areas, they would look at these at it in its, in its entirety. They wouldn't discount anything. All information would be relevant to understanding rape, to understanding domestic violence, to understanding child abuse, right? But that's not what you get. So what happened to that noble pursuit of feminism that Puga describes? I mean, we're going to examine some of this here in a minute, but keep that in mind, that noble, what I call naive understanding of feminism a populist understanding of feminism <laughs> that really breaks down once you start examining what's been going on really for the past 50 years 
But going back to what I ran into a lot with, um, in regards to domestic violence, there's two main er- areas you hear about regarding domestic violence from, uh, from a lot of feminists. What is it? Well, you hear about man beating women and rape. That's what you hear about. In regards to um, child maltreatment or child abuse, what do you hear about? You hear about sexual abuse. That's the scope, normally, of their rhetoric. Right? That's what you hear about. <laughs> but clearly, though, it's much larger than that. But these things get used for their own ideological ends. Now, the disastrous results of such things, I've found, is that resources in regards to time, money, studies, and laws and things start shifting their focus to only one aspect while other aspects go ignored. <laughs> and so what are the results then? Well, one group is getting harmed more than the other and another group is getting more help than the other. So much for that balance. So much for that that noble pursuit of feminism. But what I also want to make important here to under, so people understand is that not all the blame can be put on feminism. Again, you look at the Menem's video there, right? He's not some activist feminist writing books on feminism. And this. No, no, he's just a normal citizen, right? Uh, we have to understand that this this zeitgeist of male as demon plays out and I'll show you an example here I won't play the video but this is an example here of Louisville Kentucky a video short news clip I'll show you but it, it the importance of this video I want you to take into consideration here is that we see on the gra- grassroots level no conspiracy involved here different folks getting involved the media doing its normal thing of hype and what's being discussed here is child um, child maltreatment that results in death now if you look at their focus their focus is is on boyfriends of mothers who kill their children now this is depressing to see them go this way this is the governor of I'm sorry it's it's the mayor Christian Democratic mayor Greg Fisher Right, and we got uh, a community activist, Christopher 2X, back there. We also have a couple of doctors from Corsair Hospital. And, of course, we have the mother and the mother of the mother whose child was killed by her boyfriend. So we have all the players there, and we can see this kind of grassroots ground from the ground up, uh, non-conspiratorial, no feminism involved, really. Um, aspect playing out that concentrates on one area of uh, child abuse that results in, in children's deaths. Yeah, because it's the men's, don't you know? They're evil and something must be done. Action must be taken. We must do something. So resources are going to be concentrated on one area while other areas go on ignored. And the result being that children will die right and no understanding of why or what to do will come out of that because we're focusing on one area now more egregious examples of course are out there on the federal levels and different countries doing different things we can look at to expose this sort of thing the more nefarious areas So I invite you to go read this article here, titled, Australia Abandons Its Children to Abuse. Talking about in regard to the National Council's plan for Australia to reduce violence against women and their children. So one main point of interest that we want to get to here in regards to my video is when we see something like this, talked about by Dr. Murray Strauss. Now this is an interesting fellow. I suggest you go read up about him and his experiences in feminism and what happened with him. 
and read this paper here. I'll leave a link to all this. Uh, our process is explaining the concealment and distortion of evidence on gender symmetry in partner violence. He writes, researchers who have an ideological commitment to the idea that men are almost always the sole perpetrator often conceal evidence let me repeat that often conceal evidence that contradicts this belief among researchers not committed to that ideology many including himself and some of his colleagues have withheld results let me repeat that have withheld results showing gender symmetry to avoid becoming victims of vitriolic denunciations and ostracism Thus, many researchers have published only the data on male perpetrators or female victims, deliberately omitting data on female perpetrators and male victims. This practice started with one of the first general population surveys on family violence. The survey done for Kentucky Commission on the Status of Women obtained data on both men and women, but only the data on male perpetration was published. I see how far back this shit goes. You read his story too. It goes way back, man. Sixties. It's, it's just absolutely disgusting. So we, it's amazing the parallels too that this plays into the race debate and stuff. When I was watching, I watched a, uh, a Peach video where she's talking about political right, correctness. Oh, this thing. What is this thing? Political. How does that play out? Well, when you're dealing with ideologues, you can see how it plays out within the academic community itself, within the scientific community itself self-censorship things of that nature because not towing that line that ideological line you see well brings down that that hammer of ostracism and the public goes wild and something must be done about this these crazy obviously crazy scientists who study this sociology obviously this man must be crazy right I mean, talking about women as violent and things of this nature? Oh, no, no. Something's got to be done about that. Of course, he's not the only one with this story. There are others. I'll talk about some other day. But keeping in mind here, that standpoint, reflecting on that noble pursuit of feminism, doesn't seem to reflect so well in the actual playing out of it, does it? Let's go back to rape for a moment. Ask yourself when the last time you heard this mentioned by any kind of feminist in regards to rape. There's a Groth study, 1979, observed that among 348 convicted adult male rapists, 38% of those rapists reported childhood under the age of 16 sexual victimization by adult females. Burgess and colleagues, 1987, found that 56% of their sample of 41 male rapists had been sexually abused in childhood and that 40% of the incidents of molestation were perpetrated by females. Petrovich and Templer, 1984, found that 59% of 83 incarcerated rapists had been molested by females in childhood. When some of the stats you're not going to hear, and if you do hear them from them, They'll wrap it back around to men anyways. <laughs> so much for noble pursuits. So one of the other key points in this article being that they're not reporting, right? The state not reporting the factual data in regards to child maltreatment. Mainly that of by relationship to uh, the victim. They still collect it, but how much they really give a shit about it, well, that remains to be seen. But the point being is that this is public money in the public interest regarding a public issue, and they don't report the actual findings. Why? What do they report on? They report on, in regards to child maltreatment, they report on, what do you know? Sexual abuse. What a surprise. Now, the states haven't gone that way yet. Yet, I say. But, so, looking at that data, before I even 
looked at that data, I started doing my own work. And there's a site here called, uh, somebody is collecting all these, God bless our lost angels. And what they do is they, this is mostly just quick snapshots of who the victims are and based on some news reports. It's not very in-depth or anything. But it's a good statistic sampling because they do it by date. And what I did over the past couple months when I had time, and this stuff is hard to do if you don't have the, uh, the mindset for it, the stuff will give you, uh, the stuff will give you nightmares. But I did it anyways, and I, I looked at 200 cases. And some of it's difficult to do. They listed some on here from uh, other countries, very few. I ignored those. What I tried to do is I tried to get the the data on as much data as I could. And see, you also have to try to go beyond uh, the actual initial news report, which is often difficult because news agencies will they'll do the initial report, like this person was arrested. But, of course, being arrested doesn't imply that they're guilty. Right? Often they find that it is, uh, was just an accident or you know, there was no actual abuse there. So you have to look deeper and try to find if there was a conviction and things of this nature. It gets real messy real fast. So you have to be careful of those sorts of things. Regardless, what I found... Well, talking about the types of maltreatment, right? And I saw that there's two main types of maltreatment resulting in death. There's the direct physical action. And there's subtypes to that. There's a sudden fit of rage or frustration like somebody may be changing the diaper of a child and the child is being un, you know unresponsive and they get mad and throw them down or something that results in skull fractures and it kills the kid essentially uh, often you hear about uh, the shaken baby syndrome some things of that nature where it's just a sudden fit right they didn't wake up that morning to say oh I'm gonna kill my kid today they just did it suddenly within seconds and there's another type where it's like a prolonged confrontation and they see the child as an adversary of sorts something that must be dealt with and it could be a slow over months or even years and finally resulting in the death of the child then there's like a hopelessness which is like a utilitarian consequentialism type thinking this is much more rare there's a case of a grandmother killing her two grandchildren because their parents were getting a divorce and she didn't want the kids to go through the divorce so in her mind it was better that they die than to go through a divorce you see <laughs> things of that nature but it's more rare though then there's just pure stupidness like one guy was wrestling with a child like the kid wasn't even a year old and like threw the child up in the air and threw him against the wall or some shit killed him just stupidness right? then there's of course the insanity the rare things oh my child is uh, my child is possessed. I had to do it. I had to burn them so I'd get the devils out of them, right? Things of that nature. Then there's inaction or neglect. This is often where we come into the idea of the the boyfriends of mothers as the abusers of the children. Now, the mothers will often be, depending on their, there's a spectrum there, right, of involvement. Some of the women are directly involved to actually take part of the abuse. Some of them are very well aware of the abuse, see it and don't care. Some of them are tacitly aware, and there's all, and some of them are not aware of all, right? Okay, so we'll talk about that more later. But that's the where they're. It's so it's a neglectful thing or an inaction, and a lot of times you'll see in these cases, uh, the mothers will be arrested as well and charged and. Right, so they get charged as well. Even though they didn't do the actual beating or whatever it may have been. There's another thing, right? A prolonged conversation as well, seeing a child as a burden. This is when we get into neglect is often with special needs children, which gets us into another the same section if you look at these and you look at these cases, it's very much the same but in a different sense, right? So there's also a hopelessness there, which is another utilitarian consequentialist type thinking where you're a, the child, there was one case that the child was like blind, deaf, had to be on a feeding tube, 
Uh, and there was another one where, and so the the mother just let the kid die. Uh, there was another one, another grandmother case, where a special needs kid, she like left the kid on the side of a road, and, and pinned a note on him. She wanted him to get. She wanted to. She just abandoned him, right? But she left a note on him saying that he needs medicine of this type and whatnot, hoping that someone come along, but. He ended up in a ditch somewhere, just dead. Uh, but her her intentions were that of just like the other grandmother. And then, of course, his stupidness. One guy uh, came home when he was working. He just got done working two jobs, and he placed like his six-month-old on a beanbag chair. Uh, and somehow the beanbag chair, he fell asleep, and the beanbag chair. I think it was on a couch too, and he, the uh, the baby fell off, and the beanbag fell off with him and landed on the kid's face and smothered him. Uh, so it's just stupidness. And another a girl who gave, was giving her like a six month old a bath went and took a nap, <laughs> right? Um, all right. So then there's insanity, and that is all well. All right. So looking at the victims, I looked at uh, I looked at 200 cases. There'll be a little bit more because some of them were a double murder, like a, bo- uh, a son and a daughter. And in regards to the victim's sex, we have 56% males, 44% females. Race I did as well. We'll get, we can talk about that more in a little bit. You can see the uh, stats there. The offenders, this is where we start getting a little bit interesting, right? And we think of terms of in just groups, male and male and or female. We see here that males represent fifty five percent, females twenty eight percent. But once you start adding in, you take the we got when males and females were involved together, thirty three cases of that. And you take the males from that and you add it to the one eleven you get one forty four. And the females from that add it to there. This is reflected here as a 62-38 split. When we're talking about relation to victim, it gets very strange. You see, as the father alone, 26.5 percent; mother alone, 23 percent. When we start adding in the cases of like mother and father, we'd see there was nine here, which we add to here. father and girlfriend so we take the three cases from there we add it here when it was 68 we do the same thing with mother you get a nearly a 50 50 split there it starts to become actually the mother being more once you start looking into these cases where it gets into very much the gray area of the boyfriend of mother because it depends on how much of the involvement the mother has. So you have to be careful in looking at the cases and really try to understand, get the details on how much the mother actually knew and how much she partook in because that can start to add to that, pushing the mother's involvement in childhood abuse resulting in death over that of fathers, males. Many of the other relationships are very small percentages. So after I was all done with that, I looked at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Administration for Children and Families and their statistics on child abuse and neglect fatality, fatalities. Their m- numbers pretty much say the same thing. We see here that victims by perpetrator relationship, 2010, these are duplicate counts. Mother, 37.2%. Father, 19.1%. Mother and father, 18.5%. There's going to be some discrepancies because they have more data, and I have to look at this case by case and try to. I don't have the, uh, the money or the time to do what they do. Well, let's look at some more here. They actually got a higher number for, this is the unique count, new 
ones of child fatalities by sex, 60% for boys, 40% for girls. And here are some more of their, their numbers there, unique count for child fatalities by perpetrator relationship. Now these are numbers that you have to, I believe what I read from the Australian thing, they have to pay like $200 to get. But in the U.S. it's publicly available, which it ought to be as it's public money. And it's a public concern and there's no... Now they still don't go far enough as far as I'm concerned in the U.S. Uh, even looking on their site... You know, they they do give you a lot of data, a lot of descriptions in this and that, but they need to go. I think they need they can examine or put out to the public more of the actual what they're looking at and what they're counting as this sort of death and why, without revealing much information at all about uh, who the victims are or anything like that. Right? They can do it, but I can't find anything of that nature on here. Because I really want to see how they're getting the numbers they're getting. And they should be looked at in that way. We should have that data, data available to us. But we don't have that, so we kind of have to do it on our own through methods like this. And like I said, you have to be very careful how you do that. And you also have to understand that... Oh, and talking about race, there's an over-representation of uh, blacks in, in regards to all this. And there's been... S they address this. They say that there's nothing conspiratorial going on. Uh, let me find the there it is see they talk about that uh, racial bias in child protection a comparison of competing explanations using national data and linking to that here we see that the conclusions were that these findings suggest that the racial bias in reporting and in the child welfare system are not large scale drivers of racial disproportionality but of course that can always be disputed right but that's really not the main point uh, I want to get to here in this video talking about the race aspect. I mainly want to concentrate on the things of this nature. And it was just, he puts it so succinctly and nicely. Fully documents the overwhelming evidence that the patriarchal dominance theory of partner violence explains only a small part of partner violence. It plays out in the same way in regards to child violence. So going back to the, some of the ideology and the ostracism and the other examples just like that one fella. You know, look at this lady here. Forgot her name, but I'll leave you a link to the video. And there's also, oh, that one other lady, her story as well. What's her name? Let's see if I can find her. He had a video of just her right here somewhere. Oh, there she is. Go check out this lady's story as well. <laughs> I mean, and her involvement in feminism. And tell me there's not some conspiracy going on. Now, it's not a conspiracy. It's just ideologues. It's just like what I say. It's just people doing what they do, right? And that's how it plays out in academia and such. It's not like a conspiracy. It's just that you're not ideologically bound like they are, so you can't be part of them in group out group stuff simple as that really so look it if you really gave a shit about rape gave a shit about domestic violence gave a shit about child abuse uh, my suggestion is stay away from feminists <laughs> and feminist literature on the matter because you're not going to get the whole story simple as that Which is truly unfortunate because it plays out in law, it plays out in government, it plays out in academia, and in society. And we all get a big false picture of the reality. Resources go to one particular area while other areas get ignored. And lives, families get destroyed. So much for that noble pursuit of feminism. Peace out, my brothers, sisters, and everyone in between.